Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, a free site, bettingangle.us, a free site. Today is, I think it's April the 28th, you know, with this pandemic lockdown, the days start to merge. Anyway, let's talk boxing, but first remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, let me just say, you know, it's just reality. But as we look back on people's careers, whether it's Michael Jordan's, as many are doing now with this series on ESPN, or whether it's Joe Montana's, right? People really do summarize careers by their big moments. There's certain taglines, certain reference points that people use to figure out whether someone was truly great. Right? Well, let me just say, Michael Jordan, and I know this series, The Last Dance, is going on for several hours, several parts, and stuff like that. Just to understand in talking about Jordan, he can really be summed up by just pointing out that he goes to six NBA Finals, he wins six rings, and in none of the Finals was he forced to go to a Game 7. Joe Montana really can be summed up for everything he did by just pointing out that he went to four Super Bowls, he won four Super Bowls, and against the best of the AFC, in those four games, Montana threw no interceptions. Right, well, in boxing, when we think of even great fighters, their careers really come down to a handful of big fights. That's how we remember it. The fighter doesn't even have to win these fights. He just has to hold his own to the point where you say, my God, this guy belongs in the ring with the best. Let's also talk about what we mean by big fights. We're talking about fights against major opponents. Right, major opponents. Where there is doubt entering the ring that the fighter at hand is going to win it. There has to be some doubt. It has to be a big fight. You're thinking to yourself, okay, of this era, this guy is fighting the best opponents. And he's coming out on top when it was unclear at the start of round one. So what I'm gonna do is name some fighters, and I'm just gonna name some names who they fought. I believe this is how we remember them. Right? You think Sugar Ray Leonard? You think Wilfredo Benitez? Roberto Duran? Thomas the Hitman Hearns? Marvelous Marvin Hagler. Once you realize that Ray Leonard was in the ring with these men, you understand that, wow, Ray fought some of the best. <laughs> and he held his own. Right? Take the Hagler fight. I know that's a controversial fight. Right? As I've said here before, there's some days I think Ray won the fight. There's some days I think Marvin Hagler won the fight. But wow, you're telling me Ray Leonard comes out of a multi-year retirement and goes the distance against Marvin Hagler? Hagler's only 32 at the time. Ray goes the distance? My goodness, that's a bad man. That's a great fighter. Let's talk about another guy who, to me, you think of the guy, you remember the moments... You understand the greatness. Floyd Mayweather. He fights an unbeaten Diego Corrales. 
that fight was unclear going in. Think about it. Corrales fights Castillo. Those are rough and tumble wars. A lot of punches landed. When Mayweather fights Corrales, Mayweather leaves the ring unscathed. Mayweather's the one doling out the knockdowns. Well, Floyd also fights unbeaten Ricky Hatton. He fights a heavier Oscar De La Hoya. Folks, they were not even the same weight class. He fights unbeaten Saul Alvarez. Understand he gives Saul Alvarez his first loss. Right? As of today, his only loss. You know, every time Canelo wins, Floyd Mayweather's legacy gets a dividend. Right? When you ask the question, who could beat Canelo? Well, someone has. It's this fighter. Right? He also beats Miguel Cotto. He also beats Manny Pacquiao. Let's talk about Canelo. Canelo beats Miguel Cotto. Canelo fights Floyd Mayweather. Right? Canelo beats Arislandi Lara. Right? Now, let me just say, full disclosure, I had Lara winning. Hell, I had Cotto winning. But, bottom line is Canelo's in the ring with these guys. He beats Golovkin. He beats Danny Jacobs. He beats Sergei Kovalev. When you have fights like these on your resume, fight fans are going to look at it and say, wow, this guy's a beast. This is a real fighter. He's going up against the best. Let's keep that dividend theme in mind. There is a guy at heavyweight who it's getting embarrassing to the powers that be as to why this guy hasn't recently gotten a shot at the heavyweight title. Right? That's Dylan White. Now, I agree. You know, Dylan White has hurt himself at times. Right? The situation over that cloudy drug test result, you know, that cost him. No question about it. But understand, he's been very highly ranked for a long enough time where people have to say to themselves, gee, how come he hasn't gotten a shot at the title? Well, let me just say this. As you think of big, bad Dylan White, and keep in mind, Dylan White's beaten Joseph Parker, who held the title at one point. Right? He beats an unbeaten Lucas Brown. Right? As you think of big, bad Dylan White, realize that Anthony Joshua KO'd him. It's a devastating KO. Understand, everything Dylan White has done from that point forward has been a dividend to Anthony Joshua's legacy. Right? When Dylan White calls out certain guys, it has a certain power. Right? When he says, hey, I want to fight Wilder. When he says, hey, Tyson Fury, come on down. You say to yourself, hey, well, Dylan White is one of the highest rated contenders in the world. But it doesn't have re um, resonance. When he says, hey, I want to fight Anthony Joshua again. You know, you fought him already. <laughs> the Joshua people don't have to say, hey, we can beat Dylan White. Because they already have. Understand, Joshua also has a huge referential fight. He beats Vladimir Klitschko. Folks, that's big. That's big. Klitschko ruled the roost for years. Now, I know Klitschko's not the champ at the time that Joshua fights him. 
Nonetheless, going into that fight, there were many, let me raise my hand, who thought Joshua was going to lose that fight. Understand, too, Klitschko's not the only Olympic gold medalist Joshua has fought. He also fought another former champ, Alexander Privetkin. This is in addition to fighting a then reigning co-champion, Joseph Parker. So when I look at these guys, right, the case for them being high-caliber, world-class fighters makes itself, right? You don't really have to get into a lot of detail on their career. When someone can just tell you, oh, you know, Ray Leonard beat Thomas the Hitman Hearns when he was unbeaten. Uh, he beat Marvin Hagler. You know, you understand, oh, okay, even if you knew nothing about Ray Leonard, right? You know, if you hear he beats Wilfred Benitez, you know, <laughs> You know, you're going to say, oh, yeah, that, that's a world-class fighter. Right? You say with Floyd, yeah, he beat De La Hoya and he beat Pacquiao. You say, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, wow, that guy was tough. Well, let's turn to today's fighters. Now, there's a perception. And let me just, before I say this, be clear here. My sight here is beholden to no one right I'm not I can't think of a single person in boxing that I want to ingratiate myself with where I would compromise my opinions or integrity in any way shape or form so we're just gonna throw it out there and understand the sentiment is out there rightly or wrongly. We're just expressing reality. Right? There's a sentiment out there that some of Al Heyman's fighters are protected. Right? Here online I pointed out that I thought that Deontay Wilder after a five-year run as heavyweight champion where he had KO'd every man he had faced at that point, right? KO'd or knocked down every man he had faced. I thought that that made Deontay Wilder a Hall of Famer, right? Many here online in the comment section of these videos and view the comment section is really a public discussion board that enables people to get their point of view out, to cut out middlemen like myself. You can let the world know what you think by writing your own comments in the comment section. There was an uproar here online, more than I usually get. Many of you said, Dwyer, you've got to be kidding. Who has Deontay Wilder fought? Right? The argument was, hey, he's more Swenaki than a Hall of Famer. Right? Swenaki was a champion who had an unbeaten record, who didn't really fight a lot of meaningful opposition. In fairness to Swen, he did fight uh, Anthony Mundine, who's a damn good fighter. Right? But, right, I understood the point. In other words, if I said Vladimir Klitschko's a Hall of Famer, I think I'd get a lot of agreement on that. But I mentioned Deontay Wilder and people said, hey, this guy's too protected. We don't care how many years he held the belt. A reign is only as good as the quality of the title defenses. Right? So, of course, I did argue back. In my opinion, Luis Ortiz, even today, is one of the best fighters in the heavyweight division. I thought Ortiz was major competition. Say what you want about Bermain Stavern. Stavern Stavern beat Chris Ariola. Stavern himself is one of boxing's higher KO percentages. I know Stavern is now 
past his prime. I understand Stavern has lost some recent fights, but understand, when Wilder gets the title from Stavern, Stavern was a dangerous puncher who had beaten some very tough opponents. Right? Well, I'll just say the perception that Wilder really hasn't fought anyone. And keep in mind, this is a fighter who knocked down the lineal twice in their first fight. Has hurt Wilder. I do believe Wilder ends up in the Hall of Fame because of that KO percentage. Because I believe Fury is going to show us, or rather continue to show us, that he's a special heavyweight. Right? But, the perception is that Wilder was protected. That you can't look at Wilder's record and say, well, he fought Wilfred Benitez, Roberto Duran, Thomas the Hitman Hurts, <laughs> Marvin Hagler, among others. Right? You can't look at his record and say, well, he fought, you know, unbeaten Ricky Hatton, Oscar De La Hoya, Canelo, Cotto, Pacquiao. Right? You, you don't have that, hey, he fought Golovkin twice, Danny Jacobs, Kovalev, weight class is up. You don't have that kind of short summary to the Wilder career. So, let me just say this, and I'm going to name some fighters here, and I want people to think about this. You know, if you've been champion for more than a year in your weight class, and if you really want to be considered to be a great fighter, you really have to either fight a fighter who is viewed as great today or who is viewed as great tomorrow, the future. So in the 1980s, one of the best fighters I've ever seen, in fact, Dylan White has taken his nickname, the body snatcher, Mike McCallum, understood that the big bad wolf in the jungle out there, the young guy who people thought was the future, the guy who was knocking everyone out, was Julian Jackson. Let me just point out, both of these guys were great fighters. So, of course, McCallum, I believe the fight took place in Jamaica, my homeland. Mike McCallum decides to fight unbeaten Julian Jackson. Look it up. And the old man, older, not old, but older man than Jackson at the time, beat the youngster. It was Jackson's first loss. When you think of Mike McCallum, you always remember the Jackson fight. McCallum somehow avoids getting hit with one of Jackson's bombs. Then he starts to show you that Jackson, a puncher, wasn't the boxer Mike McCallum is. Then, of course, McCallum does what he does. He even comes inside and starts going to Jackson's body. That's what body snatchers do. Well, let me say, I tip my hat here to Jamel Charlo. I believe there are many in the sport. Let me raise my hand who believe that Erickson Lubin is special. That this is a guy who might go on a several year run as champion. By the way, Lubin, for those who don't know, is one of boxing's best body punchers. Well, Charlo took on Lubin. He didn't run from the fight. And in a shocker, it's one of the most shocking fights I've seen in recent memory. Charlo was the one who got the early KO. Hits Lubin on the side of the head. Good night, Irene. Well, my concern is with his brother, the middleweight champion, Jamal Charlo. His nickname is the Hitman. Now, let's be clear here. If you're going to use Thomas the Hitman Hearns' nickname, Right? You better be the kind of guy who's going to fight Ray Leonard, who's going to fight Marvin Hagler outside his weight class. Right? Hearns wasn't a middleweight. 
you're going to have to be the kind of guy who earns the nickname. Right? I was cringing when Ricky Hatton started calling himself the hitman, but then Ricky beat Costa Zoo, and you thought, okay, I'll, I'll have to live with this. <laughs> He's the hitman. Then Ricky, of course, is hopping in the ring with the likes of Mayweather and Pacquiao. You say, okay, well, Ricky's fighting guys. Well, let me just say, and I understand Jamal Charlo has beaten Julian Williams, who, let's face it, had a very short reign, right? I think J-Rock's skilled, but he has to show it in the ring. You don't get there by looking like you have a lot of skills in lead-up fights. And I understand Jamal Charlo beat Austin Trout. You know what? Canelo beat Trout, too, and I didn't even include Trout in the name of Canelo's big conquest. In my opinion, if Jamal Charlo, with one of the sport's big crowds, right? You say middleweight champion. This is Hopkins' division. Hagler's division. Monzone's division. Ketchell's division. Right, Gene Fulmer's division. If you're going to be the middleweight champ, and if you want to be considered great, you've got to do more than fight guys at lighter weights, right? I believe the Austin Trout fight was at 154, if I'm correct, or something like that. Well, let me just say, Jamal Charlo has been champion long enough to hopefully want to know himself whether he can beat guys like Demetrius Andre. Right? Fight fans need to start, you know, throwing red flags or waving red cups, saying, hey, enough of this. We just went through a period where Canelo decided he wanted to show us he was the best at middleweight. So he fought Golovkin. Twice. Right? We don't want the division to suddenly change where guys are saying, I'm the best, I'm the best, and we never see them fight. What's that about? Right? To me... Jamal Charlo, who's 29, who's in his prime, who has no excuse not to fight the very best. Right? To me, he's embarrassing himself by not telling his promoter who he's going to fight. At some point, a fighter has to say, you know, I've been champ for more than a year. You know, get me Demetrius Andre. When I walk down the street, I don't want to be viewed as Swenaki. I don't want people to say, you know, that guy technically is the champ. No, I want, I want the belt to be irrelevant. I want it to be the kind of thing where I'm the champ, and you know I'm the champ because I've beaten these other guys. I thought Jamal Charlo got very tested. In fact, I thought he lost the fight to Matt Korobov. Right? You would have thought after a close shave fight like that, Charlo would have said, you know what? I need to prove to the fans that I deserve this title. You would have thought he would have been showing up at, you know, Demetrius Andre fights, calling out Demetrius Andre. That hasn't happened. Let me go one step further and say we need to start booing fighters who have had the belt for more than a year, who then, when asked, who are you going to fight next, say, oh, I leave that up to my promoter. Do you want to be champ or not? I don't want promoters hiding fighters. Right? If you're one of these guys who wants to be hidden, who, who doesn't want to be able to say, you know what, I want to fight Demetrius Andre. Right? You know, 
boxing fans have been around long enough where we'll even accept it if you tell us, you know what, this sanctioning body is telling me I have to fight this number one contender. Okay, fine, I'm going to satisfy that. Then I want Andre. We'll even buy that. But what none of us should buy is guys who are champs for more than a year. And then they won't even tell you that they want to fight the lion in the forest in their division. They don't want to remove doubt. Right? Ray Leonard, understand, takes several years off because of a detached retina. But yet, somehow, even with years out of the game, somehow he's, he was able to fight more great fighters than guys who have had belts for years. Let me talk about a guy who has fought great fighters. Errol Spence. You know, we understand, and it's unsaid. And I know the fighter in public will downplay this, but we understand that Errol Spence was in a major car crash. Right? There are photos online about the car. Right? Look at the condition of the car. I know fighters want to look bulletproof at all times, but you understand if your buddy hops out of a car and it looks like that after the crash, you understand it was a major crash, right? Your buddy could say, oh, it was nothing. You know not to believe him, especially if he plays in a collision sport like boxing. Where in fight after fight, his opponent's trying to give him a concussion. is trying to knock him out. Now we get that Errol Spence was on top of the game before the car crash. We understand that after the car crash, Errol might need some time to get by the jitters, right? He might be having flashbacks of that car crash in sparring sessions. We understand life changes for people after life-altering events. Now, there are two guys I'd love for Errol Spence to fight. Understand, Errol Spence beats Mikey Garcia. Errol Spence beats Sean Porter. Errol Spence has already proven himself at 147. So now, to me, he should only fight great fighters of his generation. Right? So we can resolve the question of who's the best for this era at 147. So let me say, on the very short list of the best in the sport, are Terrence Crawford. Right? Crawford's still unbeaten, folks. Crawford was undisputed at 140. Think about it. Crawford's already had a Hall of Fame career. Crawford now wants to fight the best at 147. <laughs> folks, if Terrence Crawford's in the building, and if you're serious about being the best at 147, Crawford's a guy you have to fight. Let's be clear, Thomas the Hitman Hearns and Ray Leonard understood that they needed to fight each other. They couldn't be in the same room together talking about being the best at 147 without settling it in the ring. That's the history of the sport. So, to me, if Terrence Crawford's in the building, Errol Spence, if he wants to be the best at 147, understands he has to fight him. Let's name another guy. He's Hall of Fame Emeritus, right? He's the Emeritus Professor on campus. Manny Pacquiao, 41 years old. Right? You think Pacquiao, there's so many reference point fights <laughs> It's, it's ridiculous to mention that. Pacquiao's been around. Pacquiao fights Oscar De La Hoya in 2008. Pacquiao's a Hall of Famer. We know no one lives forever. If you're going to fight Pacquiao, it has to be now. Because Pacquiao's next press conference could well be a retirement speech. He's in his 40s, folks. 
He's already done it. So if you're Errol Spence and your criteria is greatness, you understand that the road has to go through Crawford and Pacquiao. Those are the fights you want. Now if you're a little bit jumpy and you're not going to fight them because quietly you're a little bit unsure of yourself after the car crash, right? You don't want your legacy to take a hit fighting your biggest adversary, Terrence Crawford, when you're not 100%. If you're not going to fight the guys who are great today, Right? And if you're in a room of hardcore boxing fans and you say, hey, you know, does anyone here think that former undisputed junior welterweight champion, still unbeaten Terrence Crawford, who has a belt at 147, is a Hall of Famer? Right? I'm guessing the boxing hardcore are going to say, yes, he's a Hall of Famer. You say, is Manny Pacquiao a Hall of Famer? People are going to say, yes, he's a Hall of Famer. If you're not going to fight the guys who are at that level, great today then you need to fight a guy who people feel is special who's going to rule tomorrow. Right? Sometimes the guys who look special turn out to be flawed. You remember Jeff Left Hook Lacey, who Joe Calzaghe exposed in one of his reference point fights. Sometimes the guy ends up being Julian Jackson. Goes on his own run. Vitaly Klitschko. Goes on his own run. Has his own Hall of Fame career. If you're not going to fight great today, then in my opinion, <sighs> the person you have to fight is a young guy who's unbeaten. Who hits hard. Who moves extremely hard. Well, this is the guy who hurts you, and while you're reeling, he is moving laterally, does not stay in the same spot too long. He's moving laterally, so as you stagger, you stagger into his next combination, but you can't find him. I believe people who follow boxing understand that Virgil Ortiz... If Spence is going to avoid Crawford and Pacquiao for his next fight, Virgil Ortiz is really the only other person to fight at 147. If you're going to galvanize the public. Let me just say this too. Young fighters tend to have a unique crowd. Mike Tyson was known before he hits the big time. Right? I talk with Hardcore sports fans. And somehow the group that is venture capitalist minded. In other words, you're looking for the next big thing. They somehow know about Erickson Lubin. They somehow know about Virgil Ortiz. Right? They know who these young guys are. They know about Teofimo Lopez. I believe a Lopez fight against Lomachenko will be interesting. I'm taking the older man there. But I would applaud Lomachenko for taking the Lopez challenge. Right? We know about the Devin Haney's. Let me just say, if Errol Spence is not going to fight Crawford or Pacquiao, and if he wants to be interesting, if he wants to stay in the conversation of being the best at 147, the person for him to fight is not Keith Thurman. It's not Danny Garcia, in my opinion. It's Virgil Ortiz. Right? The next generation is already in the building. We know about Devin Haney. Right? The next generation is already in the building. They're not waiting for this coronavirus thing to pass. 
I hope Errol Spence tells his promoter, tells his management, tells his team, you know, I want to fight Crawford or Pacquiao if those fights don't happen, right? And let's face it, this is boxing. Sometimes you want to fight to happen. The other guy says, hey, I want too much money. Right? Sometimes you want to fight to happen. The other guy says, look, I'm in government and I'm not going to fight anybody until this legislative session ends. Okay, we get it. If you're not going to fight them, then fight the future. Let me say this. I've been online. I've been on Twitter. I've read some of Virgil Ortiz's posts. <laughs> In my opinion, Ortiz firmly believes he's the best at 147 pounds today. Right now, he threw out some explosive tweets where he was openly challenging Errol Spence. And then I believe someone got in his ear. Someone said, young guy, this is tasteless. <laughs> young guy, you're showing disrespect. Right? Let's go further, too. Errol Spence is the truth. There's no question about that in my mind. But fight fans understand, you know, if a guy has been in a car accident, even the truth needs, you know, to take a pause, needs a comma at times, right? So it looked a little bit tough that a young guy was saying, hey, you fresh off a car accident, meet me in the ring. So Virgil Ortiz has dialed back some of his statements. Here's what I want. Because I believe Ortiz is special. If Errol Spence, I'd prefer, obviously, Spence to fight Crawford or Pacquiao. Right? But if Spence is not going to fight Crawford or Pacquiao, then I want him, in fact, I want the other two to consider fighting Virgil Ortiz. Let me say this. Mayweather was viewed as the best in the sport pound for pound. He fought Canelo. Right? I went to Vegas to just party that weekend. Folks, it was electric. Right? There were many there who knew about Canelo. Canelo was viewed as special. This was Canelo shot at the big time. I want people to revisit that fight. Mayweather comes out, he's right in front of Canelo. You got the feeling Canelo was thrown by Mayweather's faster reflexes, by Mayweather's experience in big fights like that. Right, that was a big moment for boxing. As I've said, everything Canelo has done since that fight and I believe he's copied certain parts of Mayweather's game, that left hook and stuff like that, um, is a dividend to Floyd Mayweather's legacy. If a Manny Pacquiao or a Terrence Crawford or an Errol Spence fights Virgil Ortiz, and Ortiz is raw, you look at the Ortiz resume, you don't see him fighting the Sean Porters of the world the Keith Thurmans of the world, the Cal Brooks of the world, right? You don't see that yet, right? He's raw, but I believe like Floyd, who's getting a dividend off Canelo, if Errol Spence, Crawford, or Pacquiao beats Virgil Ortiz, right? They might be getting a dividend for several years, right? Lennox Lewis beats Vitaly Klitschko. Klitschko then gets back the heavyweight title as champ for several years. Right? We remember that fight, at least I do, as one of Lennox Lewis's finest moments. Right? If you want to be considered great in a sport where people have fought Benitez, Duran, Hearns, Hagler, right? Among others. Right? If you want to be great in that sport, these are the challenges that folks need to take, right? As I said, there's a feeling 
that Al Heyman has sheltered some of his fighters. Jamal Charlo has been champion for more than a year at middleweight. Show us your champion. Right? You know something's wrong when there are other guys in your division with unbeaten records. Right? At one point, the heavyweight division was so comical that you had Tyson Fury with an unbeaten record, Anthony Joshua with an unbeaten record, Deontay Wilder with an unbeaten record. And somehow we weren't able to get unification matches. Joseph Parker, unbeaten record. Well, that's changed. Let's have it change for the middleweight division. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video. Thanks for stopping by.